Welcome to the Sober Nation FM podcast, where we're putting recovery on the map. I'm your host, Jonathan Sylvester. This show is brought to you by Sobriety Engine. Do you want to take your recovery to the next level? Do you want more support, community, and fellowship? Sobriety Engine is an incredible free online community of men and women supporting each other in their recovery. You can get a ton of great tips, resources, and guidance to help you succeed in recovery and in life. Visit sobrietyengine.com to join today. Sober Nation FM is also brought to you by Recover Health. If you're ready to get fit and start living a healthier lifestyle all while supporting your sobriety, then you can learn more about having me as your own personal fitness and nutrition coach at rcvrhealth.com. And whether you're listening to the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or watching on YouTube, please share this with your friends, follow, subscribe, and leave a review. Nation, let's hop right into today's episode. Today, I'll be joined by Jennifer Jimenez, who is one of the nation's leading voices in addiction recovery and has become a regular fixture on social media as well as numerous television networks. Jennifer recently became the official recovery advocate at the premier addiction treatment provider, A Better Life Recovery, where she oversees client relations, business development, and national advocacy efforts. She also has an extremely impressive modeling and acting resume, which includes appearing in several TV shows, music videos, and films, which we were talking about just a moment ago. She's a very busy lady, and I'm grateful to have her here. Thank you so much for joining me today, Jennifer. Hi. Thank you so much for having me on. It's such an honor and privilege to be here. I'm so excited. Absolutely. Absolutely. So first off, I think some congratulations are in order, like we were speaking about you just got married to your husband, Tim, recently, so congratulations on that. I, I said like about a year ago, a year and a half ago, like I choose to live the second half of my life happy. And, um, you know, I had a lot of endings happening. And, and I remember getting on my knees and praying and saying, God, it was like yet another bad relationship, five years. And, and like, I just went, I, I don't want anyone in my life. I know you're going to bring me someone, but not right now. And when you do, make it just be the one. And I had, I mean, be careful what you pray for, you know, and you ask for, and here came, you know, Tim, like nine months later into my life. And I had done a lot of healing again. And I learned the lessons before. Mm. And uh, I didn't believe at love at first sight. I, I thought it existed for you and someone else and anyone else. But for me, I thought all the X's accumulated to that one. And sure. when I met Tim, I kid you not, it was like from underneath my belly button, like this cord wow. like connected to him, like it's this magnet. And it was love at first sight. Um, That's awesome. And to say that we are married and we are one in the union just makes it so beautiful for me. It's going to make me well, cry. And you guys are a serious uh, recovery uh, power couple. That That's for sure. I see you guys all over the place. I, I really love what you guys do. And, you know, you just put yourself out there and you're just real and raw and honest. And, and I love that. I think that's so, so important. Now, uh, the other thing I need to congratulate you on, huge milestone. So you just got uh, hit 14 years of sobriety as well. I did. I did. Thank you. Thank you. Um, January 15th, 2006 is my sobriety day. And uh, I've come a long way from the girl in the psych ward that day. I ended up trying to hang my, I, I actually hung myself that day. Wow. Um, wow. And I just remember, uh, I, I'm just diving in. Like I'm just raw yeah, and real. Get, get in I, there. So like, I couldn't make it get pretty, it, yeah. but I'm just going to dive get right in. in. Um, I, um, I, I think about this all the time and I speak about it. So I don't forget, you know, I, I purposely don't forget. I choose not to forget because I don't want to ever go back to that. Um, I, um, I, I remember going in the psych ward and the double door slamming shut and all that from the locks. And there was a line friends and family couldn't cross. My mom was behind me crying. There was wow. two techs holding me up. And I saw this guy on the right hand side and his eyes were rolling back in a chair and he was drooling. And I was just like, how did I get here? Like, how did me of all people get here? And there's a guy down the hallway and it felt eternal, like that hallway, like so long, it probably wasn't, but he was screaming. He was getting tackled by two techs. He was trying to run down the corridor naked or the hallway naked, God bless him. And um, I was just like, I felt like dead woman walking, you know, just wow. so broken and shattered. And, you know, my first drink was when I was 12. And from 12 to that day, how did I get there? You know, I just wanted that relief. Well, um, and that's so I want to ask you about that. I mean, and because you got you got uh, discovered basically at 13, right? Yes. And so you started modeling, you blew up, you started getting all these great gigs, right? 
And, and so at what point did your addiction start and how did it progress over time for you? Okay. So um, what, with that, I, my parents are from, my family is from Argentina. I'm first generation born in America. I grew up in Argentina, was born here in California. I grew up in Argentina. I came back at six and a half and I already felt so uniquely different. Didn't speak the language, looked totally different than the California girl, you know, the typical California girl look. And, um, I just wanted to always fit in. And my family in Argentina, we love to eat. We love to eat a lot. They love to drink. We always have big dinners, lots of food on the table, so much that the drinks are on the floor. And this visual, I remember, the more they poured, the longer the parties last. Okay. I remember people having fun and drinking. Cut to, I'm 12 years old. There's a lot of shit stuff going on in my family and trauma and parents are splitting and all this stuff is happening and um i just wanted to feel like they did in argentina happy so i took my first drink didn't know about addiction recovery anything like that a disease the progression of my disease has led me to everything but um 13 years old santa monica pier with my mom and my brother on a sunday afternoon we're playing uh this photographer named bruce weber comes up to us he's still to this day one of the biggest photographers in the world and he said that i had the right look and if i could you know do this thing that he was shooting the next day it was for a big designer my mom we're from dirt roads and donkeys you know like totally different yeah. than where i grew up later on in argentina so my mom didn't know any better and of course you know she was hesitant i convinced her to let me show up the next day and literally jonathan my life went from growing up in dirt roads and donkeys to becoming a supermodel overnight i've wow. that job um i ended up doing for three weeks then i did a movie um with a, a documentary on chet baker and it actually got nominated for an oscar for best documentary let's get lost um is wow. what it's called so my first real movie is a, an Oscar dominated movie, which is kind of crazy to say, but I didn't know about that till years later. So drinking, I was five, six when I got discovered, I'm five, 10 now. So my body started developing, you know, and, and I'm Latin, so I'm curvy and, you know, all the eating disorders kicked in and drinking, you know, I was, I was doing a lot of that and I was trying a lot of drugs, but I was kind of like a trash can, nothing really stuck. Cut to, I'm close to 18 years old. Um, it's the 90s. You know, it's, it's it, you know, you have to be, you know, the waist look came in, all that. And uh, cocaine was introduced to me. Okay. And um, that for me is like, I'll never forget. Like when I took that first drink, I mean, that first, I did that first line. It was like, I got a heartbeat for the first time. You know, like it just, for me, cocaine is my drug of choice. And cocaine made me feel okay in the end mm. cocaine betrayed me you know and it brought me yeah. to my knees yeah. uh and eventually that's what drugs and alcohol does to people um people like me i had no coping skills you know it was all about the outsides as a model you know i'm going to school in my high school years like maybe two months out of the year from freshman to senior got the diploma but right. um the world taught me everything, you know, and, and uh, I became the provider of my family. I was bailing dad out of jail, paying for mom's mortgages, you know, putting my brother through college. I felt very responsible and I'm so grateful my mom traveled with me as much as she did, but at times she couldn't travel with me because of my little brother in school. So the agents would promise my mom the world that I'd be looked up after when I landed in a certain country sure. and I'd land in those countries and I was all alone and there was no one taking care mm -hmm. of me. I wasn't living with anyone. And in those times I saw and experienced a lot of dark things. So again, okay. more drinking, more using, and, and that really helped. you know, I, it's amazing when, when I hear stories from everyone who's, you know, in, in recovery or an alcoholic or an addict out there using, when they talk about their traumas, it's like, it's amazing how we've survived. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're survivors for sure. I mean, I think it's incredible that, you know, I'm sure with the things you've experienced with everything I've experienced, I'm sure a lot of the listeners have experienced. I mean, we are walking miracles, yeah. you know, for sure. There's just no other way to put it. So at what point, I mean, you know, I think it's important. You were talking about your family and you were saying, you know, that the party kept going, you know, that the more the drinks were getting. And I think the truth is that, that sometimes we kind of, you know, push away it's like this stuff was fun at first you know that's why you know the book of alcoholics anonymous like it says we did this because we liked it you know we drank because we liked the effect produced by alcohol so I, I mean my question is at what point did things start to really turn i know you were saying you were experiencing some dark things sometimes when you were away from home but at what point was this 
did you start to think like, okay, this might be a real problem for me or, or this is becoming an issue? Yeah. So I, it's funny because I love that question. It made me really think about those times when I, you know, I didn't know about Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't know about programs or anything. Okay. So yeah. um, the people that were, you know, the crazy, you know, the agents and the, you know, PR people, like back then it was like, you know, agents and all the, everyone was giving you drugs and drinks and this and that, and you need to be skinny and measuring tapes to measure my weight and scales. And they make me cringe till this day. But yeah. um, when I remember when I was partying with the people that I knew were partiers and they were like, you know, girl, maybe you have a problem. Like maybe you should not do as much or wow. like they didn't want to hang out with me. And I'm like, wait, those people are like telling me <laughs> that I have a problem right. and like, wait, right. what? like, I don't get it. They do it every day, you know, and yet yeah. I was doing it every day. Um, I remember people, I have a good friend of mine and he calls me head from back in the day, you know, and we're still good friends. And he's like, head, like, I do remember this or that. And I, I remember him saying like, head, you might have a problem, you know, like, mm. and I was like, well, what does that mean? Like, I don't, I didn't even understand, you know, except that I was playing games with myself. Like today, I'm not going to drink, you know, today I'm just not going to do that. And I would do it. And then it was like, okay, I'll start tomorrow, you know, and those tomorrows kept adding up. Um, I remember I, you know, the jobs I wasn't showing up to do anymore and they were okay. big jobs. I mean, really big jobs. Um, sure. and, um, I remember one day I was going to cop some more and I was going North on Fairfax. There's this cross street called fountain. I was going to make a right, go to my guy's house. And, uh, there's this building and it was really early in the morning and there's these light, like the glares of the light because of the sun coming up. And, you know, I looked over and I saw all these people out there and they're all guys and they're really hot and tatted. And I was like, Oh my God, like what are these hot guys doing here? Like, I love that. I can remember they're hot. And, uh, <laughs> I, I was like, is there, is this a party? You know, cause what are young people doing? And there's a girl in the corner and she was smoking and she looked at me and she made eye contact. She's like, it's in here, you know? And I was like, Oh, this must be an after hours. Like I can get free drinks and drugs. Like I've done that before, right? Sure, yeah. So I pull over and I walk into these, you know, it took me a while because I was jonesing to get out of the car, the paranoia. And uh, I go through these double doors and I hear people in this room and I open the door and all of a sudden there's a circle and everyone's speaking. Wah, 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 wah. No way. So you just accidentally walked into your first meeting? Yeah, I happened to have been at church on Fairfax and, and, and Santa Monica. I mean, in, uh, in, uh, in Fairfax and Fountain. And um, I literally walked into a meeting in a church of all places. Wow. Didn't see the cross. Didn't see, you know, I just saw a white building. And uh, I see people and I'm watching everyone. I sit down because, you know, I, I want to try to fit in. And I'm trying to figure out what's going on. And I hear people standing up and saying their names. And this guy's glaring at me like, it's your turn, you know? And I stood up and I was like, um, Jones ain't like, my name is Jennifer. I'm like, you? Like, I'm just trying, you know, to whatever, you know? And they applauded and I waved and I was like, oh my God, what am I doing, <laughs> right? Like, I kid you not. And uh, I just was like, no, wrong place, wrong time. Like at first I thought, like, do you have to intro yourself before the party starts? Like, yeah, that yeah. Was a weird thing. And uh, what's the I, secret I, handshake yeah, or the, right. the sign or whatever? <laughs> yeah. And I walked out, I ended up leaving. And as I was walking out, this guy behind me says, Jennifer. And I turn around, I try to be all sexy and seductive. And I was like, yeah, jaw grinding, grinding, nose dripping. He's like, you know, there's a meeting here tomorrow noon, you should come. And I'm like, all right, cool, thanks. And I think, like, I'm thinking to myself, like, he so wants me, right? Um, and uh, I remember getting in the car and just going like, you know, maybe I should go home. You know, uh, I could sleep this off. Yeah, I'll go home for him. I'll sleep, I'll eat, I'll shower, I'll get up like I did, and I'll show up for the next day for him. Because he could be a future boyfriend, husband. You just never knew that then. Drugs, uh, sex, they were the same thing for me at that point. And I've done a lot of work till now in my life. But uh, yeah. then, you know, that's what it was. And um, I showed up the next day for him. And mm. I came in, and there's all these people from the day before, and they're all hugging me. And I remember this one guy grabbed me really tight and was like, girl, you're not backed out. And I was like, what are these fake people doing? Like, what do they want from me? You know, they're being all fake and nice. And the meeting started, the meeting ended, and I've never seen him since. I think that man told me his name was Dave. I'm not fully sure. I can't remember. But to me, that man is my angel, my Eskimo. All he was saying that day was, keep coming back. You're welcome here. The seed was planted. And it's wow. never been the same since. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah, I mean, and I, I kind of got into recovery just with, I, mean, I don't, you know, now I don't think there's any accidents, coincidences, 
nothing like that at all. I've just seen too many things happen to, to even have that type of thinking anymore. And, and that's pretty much how, you know, what you described, very similar situation, you know, how I ended up in recovery. So, you know, I, I want to ask, I mean, uh, what, when you went into that first meeting, I mean, did you continue, because I didn't, I mean, I went and it wasn't even like, I didn't even really have any thoughts. I was just not ready. So the, the seed was planted, but I'm curious, like how much more pain or, or were you just like, were you in it? Were you going at that point? No. Well, I kept coming back and what, okay. what happened was I cleaned up and I cleaned up really quick. Okay. Um, I never did any internal work and I call it making it shiny and pretty on the outside. I made it all good on the outside, but that hole, that void, what we suffer from is a spiritual yes. malady got bigger and bigger and bigger on the inside. But I was so, I've never said this out loud. I was so used to that though. Like I was mm. so used to making that hole being big in there, but it was just getting bigger, but making it all okay. So it didn't seem any different if that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and in that process, though, uh, I wanted to switch from, I wanted to end modeling before modeling ended me. And I wasn't having fun anymore. I hadn't been having fun for a long time in modeling. So I studied and I loved being doing that first movie I did, you know, and being part of and my voice mattered. Because as a model, my voice never mattered. I was just a hanger. I was, irre I was replaceable. There's always 20 behind me that were tighter, younger, you know, hotter. This is what they taught me, you know, back then. It's different now today, thankfully. but. Um, my voice kind of mattered as an actress, you know, and uh, I started studying intensely and I got my first movie, which was a movie called Blow. Um, and um, that was like my breakout performance and got all these awards and the irony of me playing a coked out Colombian drug lord's wife from the 70s. Yeah, I was uh, thinking about that. <laughs> my method <laughs> No, I'm joking. Um, I um, and I I gotta tell you, I was sober in the beginning of Blow, but not in the end at all. And I say that because I feel it's important for people to know it doesn't matter what I would equate success to be or failure to be for me. I was bound to relapse because I had done no, I had no foundation. I had done okay. no inner work. So the revolving door, that vicious cycle started for me, you know, and uh, I'd go to the rooms from your previous question. I'd go to the rooms when I thought the going was going tough, you know, and I'd clean up and I'd get back to the game again. I'd go back out. And again, I would do maybe one, two and three a little bit and that was it. And then I'd relapse. And, um, and, and men became a higher power, you know, the boyfriend or him or that job and nothing was really feeding my soul. You know, I wasn't allowing wow. anything. I didn't know any. I just didn't know any better, um, because I was taught for such from such a young age that I was only as good as my next job cover campaign. So I was always trying, and the people pleasing in me, you know, the codependency in me too. I was sure. always trying to, uh, like, prove to you that I was enough. And if you liked me, then maybe I would like me. You know, and again. Wow. With traumas from childhood um, and like just putting, you know, a bandaid over it, not even a bandaid, just kind of pretending it's not there when it's literally right. bleeding out um, was going to cause for more and more damage. And um, eventually, you know, I, I, I would get like a year, year and a half, maybe like I got a lot of three months. Holy moly, did I get a lot of three months. But um, at one point, you know, I'm at top of my game. I'm back in, you know, I'm the it girl in Hollywood, Vogue, details, cover of this magazine, that magazine, doing every red carpet, all the award season stuff and every, you know, I'm just doing everything and I can't stay sober to save my life. And, um, and again, it's that spiritual malady that like inside, cause there's many bottoms. A lot of people go, Oh, they haven't hit a bottom. Like I still have bottoms out there. I know for sure. I still have a bottom or five left in me. Now do yeah, I have I'd a agree. Bottom? I'd agree with that. Big yeah. time. Come yeah. back. I don't know. I don't even want to think about it. Like I can't even go that. I just know that I have another bottom mm -hmm. because it's, it's about that spirit, that whole, it's like that inside, like, so I lose a job. So I've lost them before. You know what I mean? Like that's where the right. addict mind goes. Um, so I, uh, my mom and my best friend, Brandy Glanville, who was on the housewives, she, they right. told me to go 
go to treatment. I'd relapsed walking down a red carpet um, at the Man's Chinese Theater for a really big movie. I'll just say it because it's public knowledge, Anchorman. And uh, my girlfriend, Christina Applegate, was in it. And uh, I'm going with down the red carpet with a friend of ours. And uh, he grabs me and kisses me. I grab him and kiss him. And the next week, we're on covers of tabloids. And we're like the power couple. We're not. We don't. We love each other as friends. We were only friends, you know. And um, I took that drink. There's this guy standing there with a tray inside the Man's Chinese Theater, and I just went and picked it up like that. Like it wasn't even wow. kind of what you were saying. Like I wasn't. It wasn't even a thought. Like, oh, should I relapse or not? Like it was just like, come on, game on, you know. Like not. Sure. It was those yets, you know. That oh, what happened to me moment. And in eleven and a half months, I ended up having a mini stroke. Um, disconnected my jaw in a gacked out moment, blood dripping profusely. My life oh my God. was just dark. And they said I need to go to treatment. And I looked at them with my jaw disconnected and the way I just described myself and said treatments for losers. I literally said those words. And they said, we don't want to watch you die like this. You got to give yourself a shot. So I went on a two week run and I ended up checking in two weeks later and I went to a place under my terms. I love when people are going to treatment under their terms. Yes. Yeah. I'm in, I'm running this. Like I'm in charge of this yeah. thing here. <laughs> I, still have, it's under, I still have bright ideas. <laughs> um, and uh, I went and I went to this place in Pasadena. Um, they shut down my short, short term memory. Uh, there's a doctor there, one of the plethora of my doctors, not my main doctor. And he had called my mom and three times during detox saying I may die from the alcohol withdrawals. It was that severe. I was having so many seizures. Um, and I stayed from July 12th until um, November 2nd, and I called my drug dealer as a family member. Uh, there was still more trauma going on and stuff I wasn't being able to address. Um, that was happening to me. I ended up being pregnant. I found out I was pregnant in treatment from walking in prior, and uh, I had a miscarriage, and then three months later, I was still carrying that dead baby that we thought was already out, everything, and it wasn't. Uh, and uh, I wasn't ready to address what was going on, you know, and, and it was a lot, it was a lot of stuff happening. So I relapsed, I left for 10 weeks and um, it felt like one long, one long, long, long night, you know, that's what that felt like. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't working. It just like, I was buying over an eight ball, I thought a day. And uh, I could still think of Dr. Drew's little smirk he does. I was thinking of Bob Forrest, who was <laughs> one of my real counselors. He wasn't not yeah. just when he was on that show, but he, uh, he was one of my real counselors. And he, you know, I was thinking about his red, rough, shade red hair he had and what hat he was wearing, his you know? And yeah. Like for a girl who wants to numb and sedate herself to be thinking of people in treatment or things like the shame and the guilt. I mean, I had so much shame and so much guilt and those voices wouldn't quiet down. It was a really dark place to be in. That is dark. You know, I think one of the scariest things, and, and I can't help but think of it when you just mentioned, uh, you know, what you said there, and it's that, you know, this, this substance had become my solution. You know, like you said, like, you finally felt like I found this thing that like fixed me, right? It filled that hole it that, that felt empty, right? And, but then when that stops working, that is just, it's like, what do I, what do I do now? Like, you know, where do I go from here? So I, I do want to ask you, you know, there have been a lot of, you know, pretty high profile and celebrity uh, drug related deaths in the past few years. Uh, Prince, uh, Tom Petty, Mac Miller, more recently, we had, uh, you know, the rapper Juice World, which made, you know, a lot of news. And what is it, and I think you've touched on some of it already, but what is it about the entertainment industry that can really make it so difficult for someone battling substance abuse? Um, that's a really good question. You know, um, some of those people you mentioned, I knew, like I worked with Prince. Um, Scott Weiland was another one. He was a good friend of mine. He used to be our driver, um, and his wife, his his former wife um, was one of my dearest friends to modeling Mary Forsberg. They divorced before he was, and then he got remarried. But um, I, I've lost a lot of friends in the entertainment world. I mean, in general, I've lost a lot of friends from alcohol and drug addiction all yeah. over the world. Um, but uh, I, I, I think, you know, I, I get asked sometimes like on big national network shows, like they'll be like, so Hollywood brought you down? Hmm? And like, you're like, did you spend your millions on drugs up your nose? I'm like, no, right. 
school. I didn't spend it up my nose on the lifestyle. Like it was the lifestyle and drugs, you know? Yeah. Um, and letting people, you know, I, I let people take advantage of me too. But what I really do believe um, from my experience is, sure. um, and from what I see from friends that I know, is that Hollywood doesn't bring you down. It's the pressures put upon you and you put upon yourself in Hollywood. However, and I don't know if you can understand, I think you would probably be able to relate with me on this. So I start taking a pill or I can't sleep or I can't do that. And the Vicodin starts helping me and I'm feeling a little bit better. And then, you know, I'm like, wow, I'm really creative. And in my head, you know, I'm thinking like smoking joint, you know, like, yeah, I'm really out there and I can, I can tap into my character more and do this or I can feel better like I feel more artistic and it's like no I'm more sedated there's a mm. layer protecting me from or like stopping me from being able to dive deeper and get more creative in some outlet but in my head my disease is telling me that I am better at everything you know what I mean the power of the disease Absolutely. and uh, I call it changing the world sometimes kind of syndrome mm -hmm. and it's not you know and so then, you know, you need, uh, you know, people are like, oh, you have ADD. Like, who doesn't these days, right? So take a pill for this. And then you're taking that and you're like, I feel really good and I've done a lot. And all of a sudden you go, I'm going to take another one. And then you're taking another one. Then you're taking another one. So uh, it, 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 it's it's interesting because like you become, you know, it's so easy to get prescriptions. You, I can go to any doctor today and get a prescription. Um, I don't, but I can do that. And uh, yet they don't want to prescribe you, you know, insurance doesn't want to cover um, mental illness, uh, disorders, uh, medication, but they'll give yeah, you pain. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that people just put a lot of pressures and agents and responsibility and, uh, managers and, you know, PR people and, and this person and the producer wants you to look a certain way and they want, you know, that, you know, designer wants you to fit into their clothes for that season. And you're always, you know, you're just not comfortable in your own skin. And it's kind of like, take a deep breath you're okay, mm. you know? And I feel like in this day and age in society, it doesn't matter what job you're doing um, or what role you have in your life, whether you're a housewife or if you're, you know, a student, you know, parents want you to do really well and you've got to, you know, exceed at a certain level. And it's just a lot of pressures that are putting upon ourselves instead of like kind of just going, you're doing really good. You know, mm -hmm. I've learned yeah. my new words are, I'm doing the best I can do with what I got right now. I like that. Yeah, I think those those affirmations are so important. I, I think what you're saying is, you know, is that celebrities are human too. You know, I mean, you were talking about, you know, even when you were, you know, modeling and doing all this stuff, and we all have our, our insecurities, right? And, and the way you describe just like not really, you know, feeling okay in my own skin, that's how I always felt. I think that that's in, you know, I'm sure a lot of uh, people in recovery can relate to that. You know, I think that's maybe at the root of, of everyone's addiction to, to some degree is just not feeling like they fit in, not feeling like enough. So I, I want to switch gears here. And, and you touched on it a minute, ago, a minute ago. My wife, Elizabeth, would not be very happy with me if I didn't at least mention your appearance on Real Housewives. Oh, I love it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to bring that up because I, I think that the fact that there are women on such a popular show uh, who are, you know, on one hand, like, you know, are so glamorous and have all this money, but at the same time, now a few of them, or a couple of them at least, are starting to to open up about being in recovery, you know, in my mind, that says a lot about the stigma of addiction, at least beginning to change. I mean, and it feels to me uh, like being sober is kind of the cool thing these days almost. I mean, it, it's mentioned in a ton of shows, movies, it's all over the place. We've got big celebrities now like Brad Pitt. Um, I was just reading about Jessica Simpson. She's come out with a memoir talking about you know, her struggle with addiction and, and getting sober. Do you think that, that the way that people view addiction is changing? Ooh, um, you know, I was just, in the last probably week and a half, I've talked to a few people um, and I got really angry in the discussion we ended up having because, you know, I say ignorance is bliss um, and God bless them. But, you know, I really did believe that, you know, there we were, 
I really did believe that stigma was being dropped. I did. I firmly believed it. I have to say today, that's a real, this is the first time I'm ever saying it out loud. I don't know. I feel like there's still a lot more work we need to do to break the stigma because people are still saying like, not my house, not my town, not my daughter, not my kid, not my husband. And yes, your husband, yes, your town, yes, your kid, yes, your, you know, it's happening everywhere, you know. I feel that there's been a lot of work that's been done for the positive in this movement. I am so honored to be part of this movement. Um, I'm proud to say I'm in recovery. I have no shame whatsoever of who I am, where I came from, and where, you know, what my life is about. I have no shame saying I'm in recovery at all. Um, and I learned to stand in my truth. And the more we all empower each other as we're doing right now and talking about it, the more this is gonna keep moving forward. You know, it's a forward moving motion. Um, I'm just kind of a little bit shocked lately um, to hear that there's still stigma happening, you know, and, th yeah. and that's where I'm just kind of like, I want to shake people, you know, going like, it's happening. It's happening in your home and you're in your, on your block, you know, like it For happens. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I mean, and I, I'd agree big time with what you're saying. I mean, it, it is awesome to see people that, you know, before, I mean, I could almost guarantee that back in the day, Brad Pitt would not be talking about struggling with addiction or getting sober or, or anything like that. You know, I mean, he would probably, it would probably maybe ruin his career, you know, just because it'd be like, oh my God, this guy's going off the rails and we don't want to work with him or, or whatever, you know, kind of be blacklisted on this. And even though that's hard to think of about you know, with Brad <laughs> Pitt, but you know, I mean, it's, it's possible. And now it's like, people are so open about it. So that's great. But I think you're right. Like there is still this no, not, not me, not my family. Like you said, not my kids, not my husband, whatever. And it's like, I don't know anyone that has not been affected by this to some degree. I'm so glad you're saying that, you know, Period. I, I really don't know any, anybody family. And, and so, you know, it's interesting because I, I was just going to say real quick that like, I remember sitting back and judging other people before I got sober, you know, seeing people in recovery, like, God, what, a, you know, kind of like you were saying, what a loser, you know, whatever. And so I can see how we kind of like talk ourselves into, you know, I'm the person in recovery now. So I can see how, you know, people that think they're not being affected by that. I can see how they're like kind of building that story up in their minds, even if it's in their family, like crazy or their best friend is struggling or, it's like, no, it's not, you know, I don't know what that's all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I know it's true. And it's so wild because um, back then, you know, I, I'm grateful I broke my anonymity and it just happened to be on a TV show, you know, and, and I had no other option, you know, but I, once I, I realized my anonymity was being broken literally on a worldly scale. Um, and <laughs> uh I get, I've gone, like when the shows were coming out, we had VH1, Dr. Drew, we didn't know what effect this was going to do, right? And how much response we'd get. Sure. And the first season, it was like 10,000 emails a week for me. And I was like, wow. whoa, what is this? And how do I resp press reply? Like, I didn't even know how to use a computer that well, you know? Um, and I just remember hearing people in Australia and 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 um and all over the world South Africa I'll, I'll just Europe everywhere like and they still reach out to me and saying thank you you know that was me or that's my family member what do I do about this or I couldn't stand you on the show but now I get it you know or and things like that and what I realized from that was that there's not a person that's not affected by an alcoholic or drug addict mm. all over this entire world because it may not be, it may be you or it may not be you. It may be your loved one, your neighbor, your hapless passerby, a employer, employee, a friend, someone you know is affected with drugs and alcohol are in, in the disease of addiction. Therefore, yeah. you are in the disease with them. 
and make mm. no small like joke about that because it's true. If I, I love addicts, I am an addict, you know, and, and I work in addiction. So in the recovery space too. So I'm around it all the time. So I have to like really kind of go, wow, am I in the disease with them? And I have to, you know, thank God I have a lot of tools. That's what I got to say is I got a lot of spiritual tools I work with and I got a sponsor and I still go to three, four or five meetings a, a week. It's important for my recovery. And I, have I done that always? No in the last 14 years there's been times where i hadn't gone to meetings for maybe once a month or something and it was dark you know mm -hmm. and, and i have to be really honest about that too because i have gone through those times and i don't want to go back to that either no i'm i'm with you on that so i want to ask you because you were just talking about you know kind of being thrown on to this tv show like you did you didn't i don't want to say you didn't have a choice but that yeah. that's just how it happened right like you were out there you know here i am I'm this basically, I mean, you're almost just tossed in this position where you're a recovery advocate, you know? <laughs> and so, I mean, so I, I do want to ask, so, I mean, why is it important? I mean, what, once that happened, like you're out there, wh why was it important for you to continue with that and, and put yourself out there and, you know, besides the fact that, that people are reaching out to you, like, I, I know what it is for me personally, but why do you feel that it's, it's important to tell your story and, and to say like, Hey, this is, this is what happened to me. Why is that important? Um, that, that's a really good question. You ask a lot of good questions. Um, I, uh, you make me really have to think, um, I, okay. So I did have a choice and what the choice was, was Dr. Drew was one of my doctors. Mm -hmm. He predicted me dead the first year. He said I was hopeless case. He said, just go through the motions with her. She's one of those that need to die for the rest of them to live. He knew that I wow. knew he had said that. I had taken over where I got sober in Pasadena. I started taking over all the meetings after a year or so for the meeting secretary at this meeting and that meeting and started working, doing a lot of H and I was doing, and it, my life was all about recovery. My sponsor, who is like, I call her OG, like style of recovery. She got sober in Crenshaw on 46 and Crenshaw on 96. When I left treatment after at nine months sober, all I did was contemplate suicide and using the first year, like turning people like blue in the face. They'd cringe when they'd see me. I'd be like, I want to die, I want to use, I want to die, I want to use. That's all I would say. Mm -hmm. And um, they, my sponsor said, I need you to go to the meetings where I got sober at nine months sober. And like, that's where my rebirth really happened. You know, these people would tell me, sit down, shut up fuck up and listen and they're like anytime I thought I had an answer or I wanted to share they'd be like oh look what the pretty little princess has to say what it was like what it's like you know they'd be like go shatter your sponsor like they taught me universal love yeah. so that's the foundation I got sober in you know okay. and um it's all in the big book it was all book studies this that women saved my ass my ass and not my face I'm grateful for that men allowed me to have the you know the the decency of having given me that space to get sober I couldn't hug men for eight months or eight and a half months. Um, my sponsor said she was going to teach me how to use my words and my brain and my skills and stuff instead of my sensuality. I learned that. Um, wow. I, I mean, I learned there was a lot of things that weren't in the program that I needed to do as well as doing the program. I did GSR for like four years. I mean, it was crazy. Um, straight rather. I still do commitments, but like I was doing things straight. And uh, my, I took over the meetings there in the hospital and I was doing all these things and Drew started giving me his high profile clients to, to sponsor for fun and for free. And uh, he did that show, Cyber Rehab, and he was doing right. some spin off show and could I run the house? And I was like, I don't do reality shows. I had moved out of LA. I had gained over a hundred pounds at my heaviest. I weighed 267. I've lost like a total of 130, 140 yeah, pounds. Awesome. It fluctuates. And, uh, and that's a whole nother story in itself. But um, I called Hollywood chapter. Like I was done. I applied at Starbucks and Target. I didn't get those two jobs, but um, I remember my sponsor, I, I did that at two and a half years sober. And um, she was like, I remember it was like an aha moment. And I said, you know, to her, I said like, well, what am I going to give them when I go there? I have no job skills. And she's like, just faith without works is dead. Go do it. And why don't you write down who you want to be and what you want to do? And it was an aha moment because I looked at her and I was like, what the F am I going to give them? A headshot and a resume? Like I have nothing, you know? And, and, uh, 
I didn't get those jobs and then Drew came to me and, and offered me to do Sober House. And he said, you know, you, it's people like you that keep proving me wrong and, and keep me doing what I'm doing. And so by doing that show, it changed the game, you know? And we, I literally was gonna run behind the scenes more and just run the show and it was gonna be about them. Okay. And then day one, I opened the door and Steven Nadler's high and it just changed, you know? And so I became the face and the voice of those shows with Drew. Um, the whole concept kind of changed because of the craziness that was happening. Um, and mm -hmm. it was me against eight of them, you know, 24 hours a day for a month. So it was pretty crazy. Normally in a sober living, it wouldn't be like that. Yeah, right. What those shows taught me was that I was strong. I was a lot stronger than I gave myself credit for. And um, that I had a lot more fight in me. And what had happened was um, I went on a show because I started losing the weight. And I, after the first season, I ended up, you know, in years, within like three years, three and a half years, losing all the weight. That's and awesome. I did it the right way. Um, but I, they had me come on CNN. Uh, and this is what that moment was that you asked the original question. Sorry, I have the gift of the gab. Uh, is that um, I was doing an eating disorder uh, segment with Brooke. Burke, um, Robin Quivers, and two other people, and they were like talking about losing weight and this and that. And I was like, out of nowhere, because of what the rooms taught me, right? I was like, well, I have an eating disorder. I've had it all my life. And as a model, da, 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 I used to binge purge. And then I'm like, what's coming out? Like all my truth was coming out. Yeah. And uh, they were like, oh my God, that was fantastic. Like you just told your truth. Can you come on tomorrow? And I was like, sure. Like, and so I started wow. coming on these shows. Um, and one of the things I didn't come out publicly until about a year ago was mental illness. You know, I would, mm. I would say it when I speak all the time, sure, but on sure. nationally speaking, um, I had a friend commit suicide that was on The Young and the Restless. Two days later, a male model that I used to model with when I was 14 years old, who was a supermodel, killed himself. And I was like, I went on social media and I said, if you suffer from mental illness disorders, so do I. Um, I suffer from depression. There is hope out there. Mm -hmm. And all these people got a hold of me and they were like, what? And da da da. And all these outlets and you know TV shows. And I wanted to break that stigma too, because I thought me breaking it when I was speaking all over the country for the last yeah. seven years, that was enough. But I realized I needed to do more. And um, I've been open about that. So literally, there's not one thing I'm hiding in my recovery. You know, like, I yeah. mean, not that I'm hiding anything, but there wasn't any, there's nothing that I'm not talking about publicly. Um, and I think it's important to be able to, to give as much as I can, you know, to this movement. Yeah, I mean, you just mentioned, you know, living your truth and kind of being your authentic self. And and even though you kind of in that moment, you feel like you let it slip out. One of the the sayings or, or kind of ideas that's been in my mind over this past year is uh, truth equals speed. Like mm -hmm. truth equals speed at, at to which I can get to the point where like I'm supposed to be or get to success, you know, and it's like when we are our authentic selves, like the stars align, people see it, like whatever it is. I mean, it just kind of works out. But I also think in what you just shared about, you know, your journey, it is such an important lesson. I think it's, it's, and I need to point this out because like, I'm just thinking, wow, that's pretty incredible. You know, I think a lot of the times we think like, okay, I'm sober now, life's going to be great. And you just described how you couldn't get a job at Target, yeah. <laughs> right? And, but, and, and look where you are now. So things don't, it, it's, it's the growing up in public, I think, is what you were talking about. Yeah. You know, it's like, there has to be, we have to rebuild. And you were talking about, you know, in the beginning of our, our talk here, just living the second half of your life. And it is like, we ha we're reborn. We have to almost start over sometimes. And I think that's, for sure. That's so awesome. Yeah. I, I thank you. Thank you so much. Like I um I don't have all the answers. The more yesterdays I put together, the more I know that. You know what I mean? I like and yeah. when I go to meetings and I hear old timers, they're like, My life's great. It's so wonderful. And like I'm like, really? Well, what manual am I reading? Because mine isn't all the time. Like, what is yeah. wrong with me? You know what I mean? Like yeah. um, and I think it's because I 
I don't try to act like I have the answers. I know I have tools. I have tools. I have a, I have a plethora of tools and people that I have more mm -hmm. time than me and even less time with me that are my circle that love me unconditionally. I have guides, I have mentors. I have, I mean, I have a plethora of things of, of being able to pull from when I can't find the answers. Um, and that it's trials and tribulations. I mean, really, I'm just a teenager. I kind of like that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but it is a rebirth, you know, and it's not, it, there's been years, like somebody asked me the other day, like, how's it been for you? And I said, well, you know, five on my head, you know, they say you pop, but they didn't tell me it was going to start all over. And I did. I mean, one, I came out of a coma five. I was like, whoa, like I'm really doing this recovery thing. And, um, and seven was like magical. They say there's a lot of things that come with seven and it's a magical year. You should look it up because you're going to have it. Yeah. And, come soon. Uh, and then 10, I remember this old timer, I was going to do the show and he was in recovery and he was like, how are you doing girl? And I was like, I was nine actually. And I was like going into 10 and I was like, I'm just really angry. I'm bitter and I'm angry. And he's like, as long as you don't blow your brains out and you don't drink or use, you'll be fine. But you got to try not to blow your brains out because it gets dangerous right before you hit 10. I'm like, what are you talking about? I had to go back into intense therapy at 10, like, and I'm grateful for that. And uh, 12 to 13, I was turning, getting close to 13, 12, like I was saying earlier, it was the year of the endings in 2018 for me. And um, I literally at one point, um, I think it was like November or so, was on my third floor in Florida in my balcony. And I was like, I should just jump. Like who, who, no one would care anyways. And I went, whoa, like the fact that I actually contemplating for a minute, like, and it was just a fragment of a sec second that I said that. Yeah. Suicide freaked me out because I'd never thought about that. And uh, I got on my knees and I was like, God, give me a sign. I'm not getting up till this obsession leaves. Like it really, really scared me. And I had to, I've been very honest about that to people. And 13 was just my magical year. I met my husband um, and we started, you know, we had, I'd been, I went to Florida seven years ago for a photo shoot, didn't know it was capital recovery. Life changed for me, launched a magazine. Then that magazine no longer exists. But and I started speaking all over the country. And literally every month I was on like eight planes, 12 planes, like just speaking. Speaking, speaking, I've been doing this on my own. Um, I meet my husband, Tim Ryan. We do the same thing. And it was like, we fit. He fits my puzzle and I fit his puzzle perfectly, you know? And, and we do it now together and we're not alone doing this journey, you know? And I feel finally complete, you know? And that's so it, cool. I, I, I'm sure you feel this with your wife. Like, yeah. I feel that like, I'm not doing this alone. And yes, I have love people that love me around me, but sure. I have my partner, you know, and we work together, we live together. We live this thing called life together. Um, and it is like, it is fun. Like I tell people just sit back and eat the popcorn and watch our show because that's what we are really. Yeah. And, uh, he motivates me. And honestly speaking, he really inspires me to want to be better every day. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of taking the perspective here for a moment of maybe a listener that's that's a newcomer. And I'm thinking, you know, okay, if I'm new, like, and I hear someone saying, like, at nine years, it was awful. Yeah. And, yeah. and, but you know, what I'm hearing is, is number one, I think it's important to mention, like, if someone's in a 12 step program, like therapy, and and these other outside tools are you know, shouldn't be frowned upon like that. If you need that, like go take advantage of that. You know, that was something I did early in recovery. That's one thing. The other thing I'm hearing is this, even though there were these ups and downs and that's just life, there's sounds like there was a lot of, of growth spiritually, oh, yeah. mentally, emotionally kind of peeling back that, that layer of the onion, right? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, anyone who's listening going, God, I don't want to try to like do that or go want to kill my own think I'm gonna have a nervous breakdown. Right. It is just life, you know, and like yeah. the thing is be, the difference between someone out there using or some my real I call my normie friends, like when we go out, I'm like the difference between you and I is I have to feel everything, you know, mm -hmm. and feelings aren't facts. And those moments that I'm able to go, Oh, God, I'm really uncomfortable in my own skin. And however way it is that I say it. Um, it's oh, I have room for growth, you know, here's an opportunity. Um, and it's not always in those exact words, but, right, uh, right. but they're, they're, that's the feeling, you know, um, 
my life, the first, uh, again, the first year was like I came out of coma. I literally believed this is what the old timers would tell me. And I still call my friends or I'll ask Tim to say, just tell me you believe. Because they would tell me, kid, believe that we believe. Just believe we believe. That's all I would hold on to. Um, and, you know, there is no shame. Uh, you know, whatever way, like I... Del Rey gave me the opportunity. I called it my healing land. It can also be the opposite, but I never experienced that. I would go on dates with God, you know, my understanding. I'd go to dates with God on the beach and I like found, you know, I'd go and swim with the mermaids because they exist. And, uh, you know, I would just do these things that like for me is my healing thing, my wellness taking care of me moments. And, um, and I still do that, you know, and I need my time, you know, and I need to do other things. And the program has helped me immensely. It still does. There's other ways of getting sober as well you know and, and i'm not here to like say condemn it or not condemn i'm just saying there's whatever way is going to work for you is going to work for you then do it you know i i um i i feel that there's always you know two years from now who knows what my life will be like you know i mean the sky's the limit and it's also going to take a lot of work because it's people like you that told me that you know if i was sober and my line my will was aligned with god's will that i could become whoever i wanted at any given time and I still hold on to that, especially when I get a lot of no's from people. You know, I'm like, uh-uh, because it's people like you, Jonathan, in the program that told me that I could become who I want. I may get a lot of no's, but I'm going to still have to work through it and just change my goals or change the plan of my goals, rather. Not my goals, but the plan of it. Um, you know, I remember I was doing all these reality shows, and I was doing the Housewives. I was doing the rehab shows. I was doing this other show. I was doing a lot of CNN, and I was like, I want to get back into acting. People are like, no, no, no. Interns of interns were saying no to me, mm. and um, I just kept going, mm -mm, gonna come keep persisting. And I, I finally got an agency in my third audition. I got my first movie back. And I put it on hold. Um, and about it's been about like three three and a half, almost four years that I've put acting on hold. And I've been holding on to it for about a year and a half that I want to get back into acting. And six months ago, I said to Tim, I was like, you know what, babe, I got to tell you something. He's like, what's that? And I was like, I think I want to get back into acting. He goes, baby, go live it. Go live mm -hmm. it. Let's do it. And I held on, but I didn't say it universally. I believe in vibration in the universe as well. Yeah. You know, all these things. Yeah, I think yeah. that, you know, what comes out of my mouth, I need, need to be very careful because experience has proven to me that it does come true. Um, and I said in November, the end of November, like, I want to act again. I'm ready, you know? And uh, a week and a half later, I got a call and I got an offer. No and way. So, yeah, like it's great. Not, it doesn't come that easy. It's not always that easy. Yeah, right, it's right. A lot harder after this. Um, but we're I'm meeting with um, one of the main actors on Friday. We'll see. I'm not allowed to say anything yet, but I'm really excited. Like, because if this ends up not happening, then there's another opportunity. But like, yeah. again, like you're breathing, there's life, there's hope. Mm. Um, how are you going to do it? And oh, her life looks easy. Like it's not been easy. You know, I, I'm the girl that ended up, by the way, hanging myself that day. I'll finish yeah. the beginning of that story. Um, I got, they forgot the belt that day. And uh, I put my belt through one of the objects on in my room. I secured it and I put my neck through there. And when I came to, I was in a five point strap. And I was so upset because I couldn't live and I couldn't die correctly. And I was stuck in this hell of a vessel called me. And uh, because of the fixation, I couldn't speak, but my brain worked perfectly. It took me three months to form sentences. I shook profusely my hands and my legs for nine months. I would lean over on my bed and I'd go right foot in my brain, move, and I'd fall. I was in a wheelchair. From a wheelchair, I went to a walker to a cane. I freely learned to walk five, six months later. I peed and pooed myself all the time, so I was in depends. So that's what I looked like when I got sober. I I remember this day I was in a wheelchair by the window um, and they had open meetings at the place I went to and I could hear everyone underneath it was the I was on the second floor and I could smell people smoke and I could hear this chatter and I felt this feeling that I literally did not understand and in my head I said to God is it humanly possible God for a girl like me to ever feel whatever it is that they're feeling down there and if so I'll go to any length and that girl that said that that day in that wheelchair still resides so alive inside of me so I don't take a moment for granted you know and like maybe I'll take half a second for granted every now and then and then I'll catch myself you know before that moment happens but you know, I, I've come a long way. Waking up at 14 years sober, I just started crying in Tim's arms. And I was like, I just can't believe it. Like, it's a miracle, you know? And this isn't because of my doing. You know, God had a plan. And he's using me to keep, you know, moving, spreading the message of hope and 
trying to keep helping people and speaking all over. Like Tim and I go all over the country and we speak and we talk to high schools and corporations. And, you know, the other day we were speaking to 2,500 kids and 800 of them, of them got a hold of me on, on DM on Instagram. This one girl, her name was Lily. She was 11 years old, 2.30 in the morning. And I was like, Lily, A, what are you doing up so late? B, why do you have your phone? And C, you need to go to sleep. And she was like, but I'm not being heard. And you know, a lot of people, a lot of kids today are not being heard. Um, There's more kids today dying from the disease of addiction and suicide than ever before. And that is scary to me. It's heartbreaking. Um, It's just crazy. You know, I just did a TED talk uh, in November and it came out like four weeks ago and I've got like 90,000 views on it, which is so crazy, but I did it on recovery. I did it on the dark side of beauty and what they taught me. And I morph it into what, you know, back in the day I was, you know, I was the target. Has anything changed? And no, it hasn't. It's gotten worse. This filtered world that we're all living in today has got Mm. to be smashed. It really does. Um, Because you could be like, yeah, I'm having a bad time. Ooh, pretty color. Let's take a picture. I'm happy. You know, and it's like, I am so tired. And I'm so happy when people are truly happy. But I am so tired of everyone pretending that their, you know, life is perfect. Because if your life is perfect, I like i'll die you know what i mean like right, no yeah. one's life is completely perfect but i think that we're all going through different things at different times for sure yeah you know? well and when i see someone like you i mean i'm just it, it's tough not to feel something emotionally when you just hear a story about you know your story i mean what you just shared right there and I think that that just what is so powerful about all of this, it just it'll just strike me sometimes like this idea that like you, you're in a position where you're suffering to the point of where you want to end it and you attempt it. And that's what it takes for you to then get this incredible life that you have today that doesn't require you masking it with any substances or anything like that. No. I mean, how is that, you know, it just seemed, and I've had moments, you know, I I love that you shared that, you know, a good, a happy cry. Like things are so like, there was one time like, sure, Elizabeth doesn't remember this, uh, but we were driving in the car and we were just going to a movie or something. And I think maybe I had, I don't know what I was doing, something recovery related. And I was just like, man, it just struck me. Like, I just started crying. She's like, what's wrong? I'm like, man, my life is just so good. Like, how did this happen? Mm -hmm. How did this happen? But I think you just, I think you summed it up pretty well. It it requires action, whatever it is. It does. It really does. Um, I, um, I don't forget. I just don't forget. And when I hear like, I, I think that I had to, I know I had to go through all that in order to be able to really relate, you know, and, and uh, about mental illness and depression, um, I even in sobriety, I had, like I said, I've had tools, but even in sobriety at, you know, I'll go, I'd been going into depression for like maybe day three, I'd be like, oh, depression, know what this is. And so then I tell myself, I, you know, do the things that I need to do and all that. And I have to be honest, since I uh, got together with Tim, um, since we've been together, there's not been one day of depression. I haven't had one full day Mm. of going into a deep depression. And what I have learned is that I now have purpose and connection. Um, And that's what we need to find. You know, besides dealing with the trauma, 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 um, we find your connection, find your purpose. Like I'm a big advocate about like, find your dreams, find your passion, live it. You'll find another one. You'll live that one too. And then that one too. You know, I fit no mold. I'm not just an actress. I'm not just a super mom. I'm not just a recovery activist advocate. I, you know, I'm not just a speaker. I'm many things today. And that's what I can be. Because you guys told me I could become whoever I wanted, you know, and and um, I I think it's important for people to know that because a lot of addicts and alcoholics suffer from mental illness, like seventy five percent of us, and sometimes yeah. we walk around life undiagnosed. And I did, you know, and I'm not saying that's what you are, you know, but you might right. want to take a look at that too, and bring bring no shame to that one either. Um, it, it's no, okay. there's there's help for that. Yeah, that that's a really good point. Yeah, because I think. Uh, unfortunately and not to go into this too much but i think there is still 
you know, even in recovery, there is still some, you know, shame, stigma, et cetera, surrounding, you know, mental, other types of mental illness, right? Which is just, it's, you know, it's ridiculous. It's like, man, you're, you're here, you know, let's, let's take, let's look at all, let's look at this as a whole, you know, not just, not just the drugs. So I, I want to ask you before we wrap up here, uh, Jennifer, what is one piece, and you've given a lot of great advice, by the way, but what, what is one piece of, of wisdom or advice that you'd like to share with the sober nation? Um, so I can never just give one answer. However, I'm going to try. Okay. Um, I encourage someone who's out there struggling right now or contemplating having a, you know, if someone's going through a really bad day or like doesn't know if they want to do this thing called recovery, I encourage them to try to get to know the person that they're trying to kill before they kill him or her, because they might realize that they're loved and that they're worthy of being here and that they too have a story and it's up to them how they want to tell the story. And that I can hon honestly say that I love them and I expect not a thing in return. Knowing that I have many trudging with me is 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 my payback. Um, and um, really, I guess what they told me, dream big, you know, do the work, mm. dream big. That's incredible, incredible advice. And I, I appreciate you coming on. So you can follow Jennifer on social media, of course, and you can learn more about her work with A Better Life Recovery at a better life recovery .com. Thanks again for coming on with me, Jennifer. This was absolutely awesome. Thank you. Be sure to check out the show notes for all the info from today's episode. Sober Nation FM is brought to you by Sobriety Engine. Sobriety Engine is a free online community of men and women supporting each other in their recovery. Visit sobrietyengine.com to join today. This show is also brought to you by Recover Health. If you're ready to get fit and start living a healthier lifestyle while supporting your sobriety, you can learn more about having me as your own personal fitness and nutrition coach at rcvrhealth.com. And again, whether you're listening to the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or watching on YouTube, please share this with your friends, follow, subscribe, and leave us a review. Nation, thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next time.